Good night. Uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> so, my name is Fernando. I'm Alexei. <laughs> Just in case. If the name, the, the yeah, our reversed, names yeah. are on the screen. <laughs> All right. I met Alexei. And, uh, Alexei. Yeah, so, so I. So where, where do I start? So a long time ago, I had a uh, career in software, and then it people, businesses, customers, improvement, and um, so that uh, became my focus more than ten years ago. Uh, and somewhere along the way, I met Fernando. Somewhere along the way, I met many of you and many other people in um, uh, in the agile community in Toronto. Um, so Fernando and I will uh, talk about the uh, like a really hot topic of scale. Uh, that's an overloaded word uh, used in many different senses and kind of difficult to grasp. And we're going to try to break it down a bit for everyone tonight. So and I think we have an initial question for you. Yeah, I think Fernando, you have a warm-up question. Um, so it's actually very simple. So define scale and use it in a sentence. Because as, as Alexis said, it's a very overloaded term. So define scale and use it in a sentence. Who would like to start? Uh, sharks are very smooth and they have scale. <laughs> Good. Right, good. <laughs> Actually, there's going to be a comeback to that. All right, we'll, we'll come back. To that. Another idea. If you want to lose weight, you need a scale. <laughs> <laughs> It's a measure of size. All right. So oh. What kind of scale are you going to do to your architecture diagram? Okay. So scale is a measurement of size. Okay. Any other ideas? There is also the word scaling. I can do the scaling part. Like you try to make things that work for smaller scale work in a business. Mm -hmm. Bigger scale. I don't know if you noticed when Mara was explaining something, when Kathy was explaining, they were doing things with their hands. Did anyone notice? So scale tends to be, yeah. Look at look at Mara. <laughs> so when, when I ask this question, people usually say they start saying things like this, right? So there's there's something about scale and space, right? So Alexi, what about you? I think you had some pictures. Yeah, something. yeah. So so of course we. Uh, like hit some of, some of these, so I prefer salmon to sharks. Um, there is also, uh, well, there's a scale. Well, it's not the kind of scale Richard meant for losing weight, but although if you weigh produce rather than you know some other kind of foods on that scale, um, you might lose some weight. Uh, there's also uh, measuring something on the map. The map is of a certain scale, and it means. It shows you certain things and hides others. Certain things are in and out of focus, depending on the scale of that map. And uh, as far as scale is a verb, how about scaling that mountain? So, um, all right. So let's uh, try to break down this uh, this uh, subject. Uh, and um, I should say, Fernando already hinted at this. We belong to a certain kind of school of thought where when we do some sort of continuous improvement, we actually like not to start by selling some new method or framework or whatever. We try to understand how the company currently works as is. So we introduce some sort of models, we shed light on all sorts of things um, uh, inside the company teams, processes, whatnot. And with that better understanding, um, our clients find some improvements, right? And sometimes we advise them along the way as well. And so we have um, uh, a number of colleagues internationally who have been kind of in that community for about 10 years, which means uh, we have seen how it plays out in pretty much every country, every industry, and the company of pretty much every site. So how can we summarize all of this? Well, there are actually a few patterns. And once you've seen a number of these things, like variety of it, patterns become clearer. And so we're going to summarize some patterns that we call, for want of a better term, dimensions of scale. 
why am why are we talking about dimensions so let's say in toronto where i live in a building that has 36 floors and i remember seven or eight apartments per floor it doesn't matter it's a tall building right not an uncommon um, uh, way of housing in our city uh, what's important in this building if you want to build it you need a bank of high-speed elevators to get up and down it's essential but my previous residence that was of about the same size because it had roughly as many apartment units in it roughly the same number of residents it was a low-rise townhouse kind of complex you don't need any elevators there it's all walk-up but the landscaping costs for the condo association are basically it's like two zeros to what my current condo pays per year our meeting is next week and they've seen the annual report um, so we're talking about the same size we're talking about the same this right but it's clearly of two different kinds and so when we say uh, this is a cliche kind of expression all shapes and sizes as in companies and businesses come in all shapes and sizes the word shape in this expression intuitively communicates that there is more to size than just a number that there are different kinds of scales it, it communicates the presence the, the fact that the multiple dimensions are present. So we're going to identify these dimensions just from experience. So, uh, and today we're presenting a model of five dimensions. And why do we see five? Well, because there's something special about each of them. And the nature of the problems you're going to encounter in each of them is different than in the other dimensions. So by coincidence, uh, we gave three of these dimensions pretty familiar kind of geometric uh, notions of depth, width, and height. And two other dimensions are kind of special. So they're kind of not exactly kind of fit in our three-dimensional space. So our plan for today is that I'm going to talk for a short while to kind of tell you what each of these dimensions is about. Then we're going to um, kind of do breakouts. So we'll have five groups. Um, so instructions are on the table. So there's an exercise uh, for each. There will be an exercise for each of the five groups and each group will have their kind of set of instructions. Uh, there's some leading questions there so that you can discover something on your own, perhaps from your practical experience. Uh, what is it about this particular dimension? Five groups, there are four or five dimensions. And what sort of practical advice can you give yourself, your colleagues, and maybe the company that you work on at, at this time? How to deal with challenges that are unique to that particular dimension. So we'll basically break this big problem into five. Speaking of real world companies, we notice that in, um, in their real world situations, in their current improvement initiatives, some of these dimensions are far more important than others. And that's a great way to focus. So, for example, if you know that height is the biggest problem for you right now, that's where you focus and you don't worry about, let's say, some others. That means you can have your own improvement method, which may be different from, let's say, a different company which is and should be mostly concerned about let's say depth right and so that's how two different companies may be improving differently and appropriately differently so it's just not that it depends it depends on what well because of your situation is like this this is your focus because your situation is different and something else is your focus so Fernando yeah, yeah. wants to add something. Yes, yeah, before jumping into the details, a uh, <laughs> question for the group. Is anyone here going through a scaling initiative or have been asked the question of how do we scale this or that? I see one hand up. Have been asked the question of how do we go from you know this size to that size? Okay. So the, the thing is, 
no, usually the scaling question is framed or conflated with frameworks and methods and things like that. So the point of this talk is actually giving you a more abstract, perhaps, model to think about the problem of going from one size to another size and figuring out how those multiple frameworks you will hear outside so that it's safe. Has anyone heard of safe? But it's also Scrum at scale, I think. And there is other, other ways of scaling up various things like agile methods and all that. The question is, well, which of these dimensions is more prevalent? Because maybe there is some scaling you're already doing without the need to go into those frameworks. There was an alternative name for this talk that was the scaling you're already doing. Because the idea here is giving you ideas to think about things that may be going on already or tools you already have mm -hmm. that will help you move from this to that, from this to that. All right, but actually that won't be all because after the exercises and after each of the five groups presents their findings, um, we also have some additional stuff for you and that will be the most mobile and thought-provoking uh, stuff we're going to present today. So, so overall, the three-part plan, so for me to talk briefly through these five dimensions, then we'll do the exercises and then a round of presentations and discussions. And then the final novel um, uh, part that we'll end today's session with. All right, so very quickly, width. So width has, or what we call width, has something to do with extending your current improvement initiative from some relatively small and local context, be it one team, one department of the company, wherever you started, extending it left and right, trying to get as broad as possible end to end from concept to cash. So, I mean, ideally we like to do concept to cash, right? So, so many people familiar with those famous words uh, of Mary and Tom Poppendick. Uh, however, the reality is that we sometimes have to start a bit smaller because that's where our, uh, let's say, sphere of influence is within the company. So we start here and then we go like this, like along what lean people call the value stream. Right, and that's that's basically how we define the width dimension. So along the way, you might encounter additional teams. Uh, potentially, you may see multiple teams or departments forming some sort of kind of multi-team or multi-department process. You might encounter some other actors, such as um, um, let's say certain stakeholders, certain decision makers. It might even change how you engage with customers, right? Perhaps <laughs> if you started very uh, relatively narrow in a narrow context, maybe you didn't have much customer contact or customer intimacy. Well, as you uh, widen your, your current improvement initiative, <laughs> you may actually very well encounter the customer and, and uh, understand them better. So th this is really what WIT is all about. Uh, height. The height dimension is about decomposition. Sometimes you have very large work items, very large deliverables, could be projects, uh, versions of your product, could be pretty large commitments your company may be making to customers. At the same time, there could be all sorts of smaller work items present, and there is a notion of decomposition. So for those of you with some exposure to software or IT world, you often use words like Epic and, epics and stories, right? So epic is not only a large story, but there's also decomposition to it. You can take an epic and break it down into a, a number of stories. Or you can start a project pretty much in every field of knowledge. And that project may consist of many constituent work items that you have to complete in order to, for the project to be done. So decomposition and potentially flow on multiple levels where, um, uh, where maybe you start with something big, then you break it down and these smaller things get done and then they recombine and you deliver a big thing. So things like that happen in real world companies. They don't happen in every company, right? That's because 
That's why I said some of these dimensions aren't relevant to some companies, whereas they are very much in focus for others. So, so decomposition uh, and potentially multiple boards to, to track the flow of all these items of disparate sizes, potentially some traceability. How do we trace this bunch of little work items to this big commitment that we promised at the beginning? Depth. So, folks, depth is different in, in kind of uh, in a different way. So let's say we have uh, a service, uh, some kind of process that starts with the customer, ends with the customer. Um, and that may also include some project work as well. It could be a product pipeline. <clears throat> and what if we try to improve not just one of them, but a whole bunch? Not one, but N. As we go from improving one process to many, we might encounter all sorts of interesting connections between them. So it's not just doing the same thing n times, because various services in the company are connected to each other. So you try to do uh, something over here, and eventually after some delay, there is a result over there. And then there's some reaction to that, and that causes some effect over there. And suddenly it's a very dynamic thing. So, so certain network effects that exist between multiple services or multiple project groups, multiple product lines that you might want to improve in the same company at the same time, that network effect means it's not just doing the same thing or similar things or applying the same method as many times as you have uh, the services or project groups. So what happens because of these dependencies uh, that are inherent in, in the network of services? That's what the depth dimension is about. So now I'm done with geometry, and now I'm going to talk about the last two, which are really weird. So the fourth one um, is what we call the scale-free assumption. It's not universal. As I just said, there are three other dimensions. That's where you can't get away with it, right? There's some scale dependence. So dealing with bigger things is somewhat different than dealing with smaller things. But sometimes you can actually get away with the assumption that scale just happens naturally. And when you spot this sort of opportunity, when we spot it, our approach it, we want to get free ride for as long as we can. And not to create a scaling problem where there isn't. And uh, just uh, to give an idea, uh, and some of you may uh, like do a very simple reflection. Let's say, uh, if uh, there is an IT group in your company and they produce some sort of technological solution that might take, I don't know, 20% days to do, right? Some maybe small update to your IT system, maybe some new software feature or something like that, right? At the same time, you may have a help desk ticket that only takes maybe minutes or at most an hour, right? So they're clearly customer recognizable work items of like very different scales, right? Your tracking systems do look really different for this and that. No, they really don't, right? So there's basically, here's the backlog, here's doing, here's done, right? So, so if you look at, let's say, if you track them in one of the popular work tracking tools, you look at this board and look at this board, they pretty much all look the same, right? So interestingly enough, and folks, some of you have asked me to show you this picture. Now, this picture is intentionally in a very low resolution, so you won't be able to read any detail. I took care of that because it comes from a pretty secretive company. But I'm just showing you so that you continue believing me that this exists, so that I've been talking about since 2014. So this board on the right, it's from uh, a life sciences company that makes drugs. One card, one drug, one drug. They cannibalize their entire product development pipeline. 
So one card on that board, that's a full drug development program. It takes that card about three to seven years to travel across the board, left to right. Uh, interestingly, there are several different colors of drugs because they're for different diseases. Uh, there are four swim lanes on that board because there are different technologies that on, on which those drugs are based and a uh, different protocol for, let's say, clinical testing. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, this might be actually the largest work item we have seen in any Kanban system any, anywhere. Um, and it's probably roughly what, a million times bigger than, let's say, a typical ticket in service now. Right. So what's interesting is that board is designed for those of you with a KMP credential using a technique known as static. And it's pretty much the same thing, how you would design a, a board for your uh, basically IT support team. So, uh, so effectively, something naturally scales one to one million and to any, any in between uh, with, with ease. So not everything is like this, but when something is like that, we want to take full advantage of it and we do not create a problem where it isn't one. Uh, maybe it would be helpful to compare that board to this board because there are two extremes. So this one is a personal Kanban board for a manager someone in a company. Right? So each, ta each card represents a personal task. Right? So the idea here is that the same concept, you know, a ticket for something, for a deliverable, is scale free. It's the same concept regardless of the level of scale. It could be a seven year project, could be a 20 minute task, somebody does and everything in between. Right? So if you spot anything like this in your process, it means you can use the same idea at multiple levels of scale. This is what we mean by the scale free assembly. All right. And finally, the. Assumption. Yeah, but why is it assumption? Well, because you can assume the same idea applies to the level of scale. Right. Uh, because that assumption is sometimes not true. See the four other dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So now the hardest part. Uh, and this is an important part of uh, uh, continuous improvement initiatives, particularly in knowledge work enterprises, uh, in intellectual companies like company uh, within uh, whose walls we're having this meetup. Um, uh, it's, these companies by very definition produce knowledge, right? Inform some form of information and improving how these companies works also produces information and knowledge. And so what's interesting is let's say you have a new idea, a new improvement method, a new improvement approach, new technique, new like you need new to framework share, perhaps. You need to share it with your colleagues, right? How do I go from one team to twenty teams? Now you can probably easily share it with your closest five colleagues, right? But I mean your company is a lot bigger than that. And so as, uh, as people that you just thought, thought this, this genius idea that you have, they're going to teach others what's going to happen. The quality will go down. How do you solve the problem of propagating that knowledge without that dissipation of quality? That in, is there a trick to that? And that's, that's a really difficult dimension of scaling and some for some companies and we've seen such examples actually this is the dominant dimension and uh, uh, so all right so in our exercises and discussions we'll compare some of the approaches that you can take uh, some tricks potentially that you could apply to to solve this hard problem fernando anything else before we should jump to the exercises so um the idea is there's going to be five tables, as we said. Uh, do we want to have one dimension per table, right? Yeah, ideally, yes. So, you, you've so heard that, a bunch of uh, ideas that probably have some very abstract. So the idea is for you to just start mm -hmm. processing this by running through a series of questions that you have on your tables, right? So each table is going to focus on one of the dimensions, and they're going to have a conversation just to 
to make this a little bit more concrete. Uh, perhaps we should just say, for example, this table is going to be dimension one, that table is going to be dimension two. R right. And uh, folks, uh, I just uh, uh, ha have this idea. So uh, again, going back to shape, all shapes and sizes, right? Some of you naturally have certain attachment or perhaps through your actual like real world experience to some of these problems. Maybe you are actually like uh, bridging the knowledge gap across communities of practice in your company. That's really your thing. Then I believe you should try to go to that knowledge, the fifth dimension table. Maybe you are like uh, our Austrian friend Klaus Leopold, all about the width dimension, right? So those are those really long processes encompassing multiple departments. And how do you, if you happen to start small, and narrow how you end up big and wide, uh, end to end uh, concept to cash. How do you how do you broaden your improvement initiative in that particular dimension? Maybe that's your your the thing dearest to your heart. In that case, uh, I believe I would. Uh, now you can decide differently, but I would recommend that you go to the width table. All right, and so, so on and so on. So let's say. Uh, so this table is going to be about dimension one, which is width. You can call this, also call that the horizontal scaling problem, right? So that's when you're trying to go from a very narrow focus to a wider focus. Go from a workflow that goes in one team to a workflow that spans a value stream, for example. So people in this table would be thinking about that problem, and there are questions for you uh, to guide your thinking in the sheets in the table, right? Let's put table number two in here. So you, you, you can... You can move around in different tables, right? <laughs> you're not forced to stay in the tables where you're sitting. So two, we said two is uh, two is height. <laughs> so scaling in height or vertical scaling is about level of granularity, right? We talked about, for example, the composition of work item types, stories, epics, tasks, for example. It may, there may be others. But this is a problem where you're, the problem you're trying to solve, when you're saying we need to scale, the problem you're trying to solve is at what level of granularity should we see things? To, do we see them at the team level? Do we see them at the value stream level? Do we see them at the, some people call it the next level, the portfolio level, the strategy level, whatever that is, right? So if that's the type of problem you are trying to deal with, then you're trying to solve a vertical scaling problem, right? Table three. Table three is going to be depth. <laughs> so depth is when you're trying to go from one value stream to multiple value stream, or from one service to multiple services. So how do I scale this practice I have from one project to my 20 projects? Right? So it's not about just the, the horizontal or vertical aspect of re replicating that across different value streams. So that's, that's depth scaling, right? What is table four? Table four is going to be about scale-free assumptions. So there may be elements in your process that are scale-free. Right? So they won't change too much if you go from one team to 20 teams, if you go from an, an organization of 10 to an organization of 1,000. What are those? So let's give you one example, which is a typical one, the work item type. The same idea applies at any level of scale. So you don't, you, you're trying to avoid creating a scaling problem when there is none. Right? Which is, is that something that exists in your process? Well, there may be questions there for you to guide your thinking on that. And finally, number five is the knowledge dimension. So how do I transmit knowledge from one group of people to multiple group of people, right? So if I need to spread my idea from one team to my 20 teams, mm -hmm. how do I do that? For, folks, and for, for all five tables, um, so instructions uh, to this exercise are uh, on the table. Please, please flip to the appropriate page, and on that page you'll find a very brief description and then a whole bunch of questions. Basically, these questions are for you to ponder, and each question is an option for you to find something. Maybe some of these questions won't make any sense, but maybe one of maybe five or six or seven questions that you have on that instruction sheet will resonate with you, and that might be your takeaway for, for the night, and that might be the value of the session. 
All well, right. besides the entertainment that will follow. Um, so think about your current context, your current organization, or maybe organizations you've worked with in the past, if that helps. Which of these dimensions do you think dominated that particular situation? So which one was more relevant? And find the appropriate table, find people who are interested in the same type of problem, have a conversation, we'll be walking around, and we'll debrief after. Any questions before we begin? Make sense? All right. Width is here. Uh, height is here. That's depth. <laughs> Scale-free assumptions over here. Knowledge over there. All right. How much time do we give up? Ah, look. That's, that's just absurd. Just let it play okay. for at least 10 or anymore. Probably 15, 20, I, I think. Maybe I've taken a bit too much talking. Too much time talking. But, all right. At least some people connected by eyesight and that. Uh, uh, I think some people paid attention. A few people paid attention. <laughs> you have no copies. Oh, uh, there, sh there should have been three, three in each table. Yeah, three at each table. There wasn't in. Yeah, there, there were like three per table. <laughs> so, <laughs> one, two, three. You have yes. one copy here. Yes, at least one. You just, you just need one copy just to read the question. Yes. Out of all these five, I find for number one, skill to assumption the most difficult to understand. Okay, go, go so to Did you find table. the? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Go, go to the scale-free table. Wait, I mentioned. I don't uh, no, 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 I think we just uh, ran out of one. All right, we've got at least some copies of each. I think this table has four, but they have to. Oh, no, that's. Can we make up some areas? Okay, so think about, um, you have a bunch of questions here to think about, um, for example, if you're, if you're dealing with width, you probably have, so what, what are you thinking, what, what are you thinking this applies to you? Um, I think it's expanding multiple teams. Okay, so you're trying to go from one, one team to another. Okay, so if you go downstream from each of these teams, right? At what point do the other teams enter? So if, if you focus on one team, for example, you have several teams, right? So if scaling in that dimension would mean that you start trying to cover more of the value stream. Yeah, yeah. So think about for that particular team, where does the work come from, right? And where does that work come from? So try to walk upstream and eventually it will hit a customer, an external customer, right? Yeah. And then eventually if you do the same thing the other way, so when we finish our work, where does it go? You put it in production or you, send, you hand it off to another team and to another group? So that's how we start building these longer and longer value streams. Oh, I right? see. And, so, and then you need to figure out, well, how do I represent that, for example? And that's what your framework does. You have the same value stream. You have one value stream for one board. See, what happens normally is if you're looking if you're looking at one single team, that team works in only a portion of the value stream, right? So horizontal scaling would mean trying to cover more of the value stream, which means that probably need to start connecting this team to the next team and to the next team and to the next team, and the, and the team here to the team that is upstream and, until eventually hit the customer. So then you're... Right. What would, what, do we, what would it mean to go full end-to-end, -end, right? So probably means that you need to include other teams upstream of you and downstream of you, right? Your team is, is not enough anymore. So, so kind of what I'm thinking from my personal experience, I did like, um, mm -hmm. a universal portal, um, and so that encompasses a bunch of other applications, and then also we have to deal with yeah, below, so I guess that would be one by the stream, but the portal itself is like login, whatever, and then the interconnected uh, applications that Mm -hmm. Okay, the question is which other groups become part of that, right? Because if you're looking at a single team, that team probably covers a little portion of the value stream, but the work extends upwards and downstream, right? So that's the first question, right? So think about that. Which other groups, how would you identify them? How do you bring them together? But after that, uh, there's another question here, for example, about what happens to the, the way you commit, right? So where, where is the point where the work 
ceases to be an option, it becomes a commitment, for example. Yeah, yeah. Right? So where is that? Is it within your team? Is it probably is in a team upstream of you? So yeah. this is how you start identifying these commitment points. What's Facebook working? I was in like Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was in all right. Yeah, I mean, simplicity is tricky. Right? <laughs> well, a non problem is staring you in the face. It may be so difficult to. Uh, resist creating a problem out of it. <laughs> yes. All right. So, so, so uh, when you use uh, a similar technique to, let's say, objects of very different sizes, and it still works. Right? You can sometimes you can get away with it. So, what would be examples in your experience when you dealt with, let's say, pretty significant disparities in size, but you took effectively the same approach? That means you just found something that's scale free. And so, uh, one example is so some of them are hinted in the questions. So, if you look at some of the um, let's say, work items that exist in real companies, right? Some of them are pretty small. Let's say if we had some sort of uh, operational issue and, uh, let's say, operations help desk receive the ticket, for it, right? It's a pretty small work item. So I just showed you how some work items are, like, thousands of times bigger than that. However, if we were to design a, uh, a visual uh, board for managing flow of such work items, we could design them from effectively the same ingredients, right? Using the same principles. So that means our method of designing such a visual board is effectively scale free because we can use it for this kind of work and for that kind of work, right? And pretty much for anything in between. And what about the constraints? This can be applied at a personal hospital level all the way up to the Right. Uh, or let's say, how do you spot the bottleneck in this process? Right? So let's say this is your flow board. You designed it, again, using a scale free approach. And let's say you see that, oh, right here you have a bottleneck. Right? So and now the the bottleneck is of course itself much bigger on the uh, on the uh, on the bigger board because that could be like millions of dollars of r and d uh, waiting here and not moving towards the result whereas on your personal board that would be just you know much smaller effort right but the method that would you would use to spot that bottleneck and would draw attention to it and explain it to your colleagues is exactly the same Right, so specific applications are, of course, of different scale, but the methods, how, how do you find the problem, how do you explain it to your colleagues, how do you motivate them to solve that bottleneck, would be the same. So that, that would be a scale-free technique. Um, so does this help a bit, with the help of some... Uh, Th that too. Uh, so, but so my fault. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So, uh, so let's say if you started uh, initially with the team up here, right? So, and uh, improving how they do the work over here, and then let's say you started extending upstream in this direction. So. Potentially, there could be some decision I just came back from vacation. Uh, <laughs> over here on the left, where let's say still, some stakeholder decides, <laughs> oh, we should build Project A instead of Project B, right? And as a consequence of that decision, this team will be occupied with a bunch of tasks in Project A, right? So, but the, uh, but if you're if you're only working here, you don't see that decision point, right? So you only deal with the team's backlog. Right, but as you as you broaden the focus, and now you are involved somewhere here, you found the decision point from which that whole backlog is a consequence, a binary decision. If somebody decided to build a different project instead, we would see like hundred different things in that backlog, and not the things we currently have. Right, so so you may be uncovering such decision points that exist in the actual process of your organization. So you make a decision um, in the left team community, you see mm -hmm. the project, yes. you run through project A, all through whatever your first mm -hmm. three, your right. first three dreams, and now this guy is like, hey, like, we've got to change this around. And finally, the work reaches them. So what I'm saying is that if initially the focus of your improvement initiative is all here, then you don't even see this decision point. But you begin to see it as you you shed light on the on the broader and broader uh, span of the of, of the whole process. So. Right. Mm -hmm. So so what what uh, what you will uncover eventually. So you start with one team. So it's a narrow scope, and then that's 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 why I say. I mean, in 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 uh, Mary and Tom's book, there is concept to cash. In the real world, you're given a team to coach, and this is this is your world. Right. So, but eventually, we want, to, we want to get from here to to this. How do you introduce across the board? Gradually. <laughs> Gradually and with a lot of situational awareness and with a lot of shuttle diplomacy and with a lot of soft skills and right. ability to empathize with your neighbors. All right. How are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Are you reaching some conclusions? Mm -hmm. are, are you reaching any any sort of conclusion? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you getting to any sort of conclusion? Are, are you reaching any conclusion? Or any uh, no questions? Or uh, do you need more time for debate? That's what I'm. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> I think this is a loaded question, but I'll just say organizational feedback. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by what organizational feedback? Uh, in the generic sense, so any mechanism that allows you to capture signals of what's happening, evaluate them, and then decide for the next round. There are different types of things for that. For example, each time you deliver something to the market, that gives you signals about how well your product works, so you can decide what to do in the next round. For example. I have a that would be one feature. So okay, but each time you do retrospective, that's a feedback loop. Right? Each time you have a stand up with your teams, that's a feedback loop. Right? So any sort of mechanism that allows you to inspect and adapt. What type of mechanisms do you have? Now the, the stand-up is very localized to a team, but if you if you think about the problem of depth, right? You're talking about multiple services, multiple multiple value streams, for example. So I, 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 I'm going to get into that when we get into the debrief. But the the point here is, once you get into this type of scale, in the problem is not how do I replicate things, is how do I connect them. Right? That's the problem. Really. Uh, 
How are things going here? Do, are you reaching any sort of conclusion? Yeah. All right, kind of. Okay. All right. Start a debrief? Yes, uh, go ahead. Hello. Does this still work? <laughs> I wasn't sure if this trick still works after the pandemic. <laughs> All right. Should we debrief? All right. So let's start with the way with let's start in order perhaps. So um, we're going to be debriefing each of these dimensions independently and discussing them as if they were completely separate things. But the reality is that in your in real life you probably are scaling in more than one dimension at a time. However, remember what Alexis said, maybe one of these dimensions has more relevance in your context mm -hmm. than others. Right? But they yeah, are not completely it's separate. It's not you can just scaling one and forget the others. Yeah, and one sometimes, will dominate. sometimes it's two. Uh, as, as we found out, actually, we, we have like some of, the, some of our friends uh, largely work in the context where two of these dimensions dominate and they simply uh, care less about three others. They can get away with that assumption. Uh, right. However, for you, this, the combination uh, of five may be out of five may be different. The, the other thing that maybe should be obvious by now is that when we frame the question of scaling, it's not about the implementation of a specific framework. It's about what type of framework you're trying to solve regarding this model. Right? <laughs> are we trying to grow a value stream? Are we trying to connect this to multiple value streams? What, which one is it? Right? What type of scaling problem do you have? So let's assume. Let's let's imagine that you're your dominant dimensional scaling is with horizontal scaling, right? So for the people in this table, what did you conclude? What do you think would be your main challenges when you're trying to scale that way? Um, I think, so the example we actually used was a reference to CPG. Uh, so naturally, you say you're going to start selling some product, why is going to acquire it, et cetera, et cetera, those grants and activations. So I found this is just my interpretation. It seemed a bit waterfall because one team is competing to go to another team to go to another team. Uh, or is that just a poor interpretation of this? Okay. It's the waterfall question. <laughs> so remember, we haven't said anything about size of batches or cadences, right? So waterfall really is about delivering large batches in, 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 a, in a specific cadence. Uh, we haven't said anything about how large your batch should be, right? And how we haven't said anything about how much um, compartmentalized mm -hmm. your process should be. Should I do my all my analysis before I do any of my design? Right? We haven't said anything about that, right? Actually, it's kind of a separate question for us, right? So none of this involves or, or assumes any sort of waterfall or agile-ish type of process. What we're saying really is more something that goes like this. If I have if all I can see here is this thing, right? If all, all, my, all what I can see here is this, and what I'm trying to see, what I'm trying to do, the problem I'm trying to solve is how to, first, I recognize that this team is part of a larger value stream or service, right? So they don't talk to a customer, they, they receive their work from somewhere, they do something and they pass on the work somewhere else. So think about, for example, a team that receives all the requirements from a product group, right? Well, you can ask, this product group over here, where do they get their requirements from? Well, they talk to marketing. Okay, well, does marketing get their ideas from? Well, they talk to such and such, and eventually you get some to somebody outside the company. My customers always have a hat. Okay, so the, the, the point here is if, if this is the type of problem you're trying to solve, right, then you're dealing with, with horizontal scaling problems, right? And then you keep going. So, okay, when they finish their work, where does it go? Well, they give the work to a, an integration team, right? But perhaps we, uh, receives work from other teams. And what do they do with the, with the result of that? Well, they give it to an operations team. And eventually that puts it in production and it, then it goes to the customer over here, right? Now, if you want to call this waterfall, fine. <laughs> but the point here is that this is how work usually happens, right? So work is handed over from group to group to group. If that's the situation you're in, and this is the problem you're trying to solve, then you're dealing with a horizontal scaling problem. That's, that's the message here, right? Then depending on your framework of choice, depending on your tool of choice, depending on whether you want to go more agile or less agile, 
Well, there's going to be different implementation solutions for this, right? So in Kama, what you would do is we we'll just try to visualize all this, for example. Uh, maybe somebody will say, well, maybe we shouldn't have these many teams and we should reorganize the whole company and have them every, everybody in the whole in a single cross-functional team that does everything. Okay, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Not that we're, I'm recommending that, but point, the, my point is that if this is a problem we're trying to solve, this is a sort of horizontal scaling problem, and then, uh, well, there's going to be other questions, right? So there is this one question there, for example, about identifying how commitments are made, right? So. At what point work here ceases to be an option and becomes a commitment? When you're trying to solve this problem, that's when usually you eventually deal, have to deal with that problem, right? That's when you find that, for example, your initial team is this one, right? But the work they received has been promised to the customer months before by some other group, right? So you start asking questions and you start finding that there is a line here, right? All the work that happens after this line and all these teams is already promised. There are dates sticking on it, for example. There are promises you, made, right? Shouldn't you ideally be having the decision point in the beginning of the value stream? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> the point here is not what ideally it should be. We're trying to understand what it is today. Uh, where, right? where it is today. Uh, I, ideally, it can actually be quite close to the start and sometimes quite close to the end. So sometimes actually decision what to build that involves a lot of work and a lot of experimentation, a lot of figuring out. In this case, your decision point, what to build, will be way downstream. Uh, think lean startup. Uh, in other cases, if let's say you, you're building something with fairly stable requirements, um, actually, you know, there's really not much to discover. So in this case, the decision point may be uh, pretty early, but then there's a, an awful lot of work to be done by, by people of different specialties. And sometimes, like even though it's drawn here as different teams, uh, and that's more of a reflection how we often find this in the real world, but it's really meant here is that these are activities, and sometimes the same person can do multiple activities, right? right? And so in this case, depending on uh, again, specifics of the company, the product, uh, and all sorts of other circumstances. You may be able to re reorganize more effectively around this once you see this bigger picture. Um, Anybody here attended Jeff Anderson's talk on his book on, um, what's the name? It's uh, Reorganizing, or, or fragility organizing Towards fragility. Agility, right? So he you will paint a very different organize picture. Better, right? he, he will give you a very different yeah. solution for how to deal with the implementation of this end to end value stream. But he's still dealing with an end-to-end -end value stream, right? Um, so the, the the concept here is that if the problem you're trying to solve is how to add, how to cover or to have wider a wider view on your value stream, we call that a horizontal scaling or width dimension problem. And this is where you will find things like handovers between teams, handoffs between teams, right? One team passing work to another, different groups are involved. So maybe all your life was about dealing with this team. But by doing this exercise, you, you realize that to, to manage this more effectively, you need to get multiple teams talking, right? And perhaps getting into this conversation, should we have these many walls that we use to toss things over? Maybe we should do something different. Yeah. Right? Now, the question of where, how we make commitments will eventually show up when you do this, right? At what point are we making promises to the customer? We call that the commitment point in Kanban, right? Mm -hmm. Well, where is it? Which, which group is involved with that? Who is involved in the conversation? How the work crosses the line, right? So mm -hmm. eventually, that question needs to be asked. And what happens then is that you end up splitting your workflow in two parts. We call this section here the upstream, and this is the downstream. And well, there are different problems in each of those and different solutions and blah, blah, blah. And this is where these type of, these type of mm -hmm. tools start entering the, the lands. Right. Uh, yes, let's take one more question, uh, but then uh, another thing we uh, we're not going to solve every problem, uh, and as you can see, this is a pretty fractal topic. And actually, those who uh, read the article already, because it was published in in November, but we included a QR code with a link to it on the on the front of the instructions, and it will also appear at the end of the presentation. Uh, so if you take one big topic, break it down into five topics, and then each topic has five patterns in it. In it. Well, I gave myself a task to, to write about that, an article. So that article uh, under that link, well, it came in in very concise 6,500 words, uh, right? So, and that's only down one more level, right? Uh, 
and of course, each of those sub problems within each of the five areas has its own nuances and whatnot that we could talk endlessly. But let's take one more question. And I'll say something about time, which also yeah. lives in this yeah. dimension. Uh, but let's take the question first. Yeah. So, like, the, would you like one of the biggest like anti patterns in this kind of process be that like one of the end people that are talking with the mm -hmm. customers they make a commitment before talking with the rest of like the downstream? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of one of the biggest? So I wouldn't say that we don't know if it's an anti-pattern or not, because if all we see is this, we can't even know, right? So, so we don't even know what really what is really going on. And when we see the bigger picture, then we may have all sorts of options, which of course will be different depending on the context. I would actually frame it the other way around. If the if the problem you're trying to solve is that one, so I'm noticing that somebody's making promises on my behalf and I don't know how that works, right? If you're trying to solve that problem, then you're dealing with a horizontal scaling problem. You're trying to scale horizontally to solve that, right? Because you're here and you see that all your work already comes with dates and promises and you want to know how that works. Mm -hmm. Well, that means understanding the process that is upstream of you, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe you talk to another group who also has the same problem and then eventually talk to some other group that has the, the decision but that's where the decision happens, right? Yeah. So this is the people who actually talks to the customer and makes commitments and somehow commitments are then, are then pushed. Well, solving that type of problem requires horizontal scaling. Right. right. So, folks, to wrap up uh, 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 this particular dimension, move, move on to the four others, just one important element of time. Time, uh, you have probably heard me talk about it all the time. And yes, the book Fit for Purpose also deals with that. Uh, time is a virtually universal fitness criteria for customers. There's no customer in the world that doesn't care about time. time when to it will be done, way. how long it will take, will it be delivered in a timely fashion, will the train depart on time uh, at the end of this session, after the end of this session, and so on and so forth. Every customer cares about time. Time is this. Uh, and if we're only looking at this, we don't even have an idea what time and process is and well, how we're going to meet that very important customer criteria who can't even measure it. So a very common symptom of this is you go to any team room, please note to the time units that are being talked about. They're all hours and days, maybe sprints at the most. Go to a boardroom, talk to customers. The time units are what? Months, quarters, years, right? That's the discrepancy and that's a symptom that uh, your current improvement initiative is just not yet scaled enough in the width dimension. Yeah, if you're, and if potentially if you're trying to answer the question of how long will it take us to finish this, you're dealing with a horizontal scaling problem. Right? To solve that, you need to scale horizontally because you need to find where this promise is made and where is this line, right? The, the finite line that puts things in the customer's hands so you can measure time in between. All right, dimension number two. Where's the table for dimension two? Height. So what do you conclude would be the biggest challenges when scaling vertically? Well, we had a very good discussion about height and hierarchies in general. Mm -hmm. They come down to time as well, that came out. So in other words, Love you it. might have people working at a very low level, in which case they need to know information and data very, very rapidly, perhaps even on a daily basis. Then you might go to, if we're in Scrum, you might go to a two-weekly sprint basis. Their managers above them might want something more on a monthly basis rather than day-to-day -day or two weeks. And then as you go up the levels, uh, you get to perhaps even a month, a year, quarterly, half yearly, that sort of thing. Um, anything else that we talked about? I mean, it was your interesting dimension. <laughs> time being the same thing. Yeah, sometimes you can look at the time. Sometimes you can look at the time, and the time block, it's one particular one for a certain area, like let's take a screen, but depending on how you scale the product or pieces of a product, then that might go over multiple teams if we stick with Scrum, for instance, or it might be only a time to do So then it comes down to right. how do you break that down? Do you have to write that down <coughs> so you can address mm -hmm. it accordingly? And then you, you do the vertical scale. Mm -hmm. so then, 
So, no, no, finish, finish your thought. Yeah, so because then you, you turn into no streaming, so, mm -hmm. so you can go into deep into other dynamics. So. Right. Yeah, about the node scaling. So you may the idea here is that you would, the the concept to represent multiple levels is the same work item type, but here is about which levels do you need, right? So if you are going to decompose, which levels do you need? So yeah, just uh, one bit of wrap up on this particular dimension. Uh, if I can put it shortly, you need fewer levels than you think. So we would basically like. Uh, uh, again, using either the size uh, argument or, or the time argument, uh, we would say uh, aim for a bigger fan out between levels. So ideally, big work item breaking down into 20 items rather than two or three. Bigger fan out, and with bigger fan out, you need fewer levels. Um, and also, some of the levels aren't exactly similar to others, and you can exploit that for the sake of simplicity. Things like, uh, let's say, task lists. Task lists, you can park them into, let's say, explicit policies, definitions of done, as opposed to explicitly breaking down one big ticket into 10 smaller tickets, one for each task, and so on and so forth. So bigger fan out, fewer levels. That that really simplifies. Aim for more informational gain uh, uh, at the connection of every pair of levels. Uh, so we often find that um, there are quite a few companies where you can't avoid having at least two levels of flow, but when it comes to the third level, you should start questioning whether you need another one. So question relentlessly. So um, if the problem you're trying to solve is, again, which level of granularity we need, then the question will be asked, uh, so which, how many, what level of granularity we need, then which, what what levels do we have, right? So the question that I found is interesting to ask at that point is what was the meaning of each level and have clarity around that, right? So who here has epics that decompose into stories that decompose into tasks, right? So that's a very common one. So epic, story, task, right? So some people say, well, the epics are part of a release, for example, uh, or a project or something like that, and there is something. No, I'll get there. Uh, the thing is, uh, as Alexis said, you may need less levels than you need, but let's say for some reason you have this, this structure. The, the recommendation is make sure everybody is clear on what the meaning for this structure is. And usually what happens is you, need, you will need one level that represents customer commitments, right? Something that represents a customer recognizable thing you make promises on. So maybe that's your epic. Now be careful because in many places I find epics don't represent that, they represent just containers of stories. <laughs> but that said, uh, regardless of what you call it, some people call, will call this feature, for example. Or um, what's another common term for this? Um, theme. Hmm? theme. Theme, whatever, whatever it is. The point is there has to be one level that represents commitment. So when you make promises and you make and you, and you essentially transact with your customer, you transact at this level, right? You don't make promises in small stories, although some places do. Right? The, the point is there has to be a level that represents that. Then, then you need another level usually under that that is to manage flow. Because these usually are things that are too big and they don't move very fast. So if you want to manage flow on day to day, to, and by flow here, what I mean is movement, right? making sure work keeps moving and gets done. So usually that means a smaller item, that's the second level. Then that begs the question, what is the third level for? Right? And this is the reason why many teams end up dropping this. Right? But if you do need a third level, usually what that means is individual, individual work. Right? So my experience is that usually this goes away. And you can get away with two levels, one representing commitment, the other representing flow. And then there's a third. It, this is usually not a ticket on your board. It's, it's usually a container of things. So this is usually for containing containers or batches. So it's not really a level. It's more an organizational thing that you need in your tool sometimes. Right. right. And th 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 those could be simplified as well. And, uh, and uh, how exactly that will depend on the context, uh, just using the fact that this is not uh, similar, like the similarity here yeah. is not the same so as here. So this is something different. All right. Let's move on to the depth 
dimension uh and we've we've yeah. got three more mm -hmm. uh, to cover you see different comes first because I do see when you are trying to horizontally grow, like right. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of which of first or second. These are three independent dimensions. Most likely, one of these will dominate in the problem you're trying to solve, but is connected to others, right? Because if if you're trying to do this, for example, a horizontal type of scaling, most likely you will also have to start seeing things at a higher level. So that's this will will show up, right? But maybe all you're trying to solve is within a single team better granularity on the commitments we make, for example, and. You're not trying to expand your view on your value stream, and you're not doing any horizontal scale. But yeah, they're usually connected. More than one comes first, and the other comes after. All right, depth. So um, at first, we were struggling to actually figure out what it was because uh, it was a little bit. Um, we we kind of started with the idea that well, if we have too many dependencies, we want to get rid of those dependencies anyway. So we need to reorganize in order. To mm -hmm. Um, to scale that, anyways, and um, yeah, that's probably with recording, right? So um, we actually tried to brainstorm a couple of situations where that was not possible, and much of it was related to uh, very complicated subsystems that require very specific skills, and this way you're creating a network of individual skills and components that need to be changed, and. Um, so we came, the, the biggest challenges that we had was, or that we identified, was making sure that the changes um, are identified or are at least described from the impact that they have on the entire system, and not just on one component. And then also trying to figure out what the signals would be to know when such change can be rejected mm -hmm. into the system at large. Yeah. So as I said, I think earlier, the I would go the other way. So if the problem you're trying to solve is I have a bunch of dependencies and somehow I need to do something about them, either make them simpler, make them work better, more efficient, then you're dealing with a scaling problem on the depth dimension. Right? And so the question is, what are the main challenges there? Right? Right. So, and you mentioned some of them in a very concrete case. I think on a solution you maybe have in mind or the type of solutions you tend to recommend. But depending on your toolbox of choice, then different things will show up. So the way, I don't know. Uh, safe recommends to do dependencies, I suppose, is very different from, I don't know, Scrum scale, right? Yeah. So the, the, the toolbox will be different, but then we're dealing with a scaling problem on the depth dimension. What are the challenges there? So do you think about that? What, what do you think are the biggest challenges in general? One, you mentioned one is, well, identifying which, which of these things are, right? Yeah. So just to be clear to, for everybody, in, in, this, in this dimension, the idea is, or the, the problem is, we already have solved one value stream. We're trying to just do the same for more, for one more value stream, and then another, and then another, right? Or dependent value stream. So the, the problem of dependencies is a, is a depth problem, right? So this is one. There was another one you were talking about, actually. Nima asked me a question about that. The feedback. Feedback, right? Because it's not just about replicating the effort, right? So I have one team or one value streams. I just want to apply Agile to 10 value streams. So that's a scaling problem in the, in the depth dimension. But there is another challenge, which is, the feedback loop in between all those, right? That's the additional part that sometimes we don't think about. It's just, it's not a matter of replicating, right? I did it with this team, I just do the same thing with 10. Okay, you can, you need to do that, perhaps. But then there is a problem of these teams having dependencies and connections and, and there are other types of feedback. For example, improvement, right? So we need to somehow work together to improve the system as a whole. That's another feedback loop, right? So the introduction of various feedback loops that allow for groups to work together and deliver together when they have to, like in this case. Right? So imagine that you have one value stream that looks like this, and there is another parallel here that looks similar, you know, multiple teams working on a, on a workflow. But for some work, there is a dependency here. Right? Well, you need to somehow deal with that problem. That's one thing. That, that, that's a delivery feedback loop. Right? But also, if you just look at the, even, even, even if these two are not connected with a, an explicit dependency, let's say you cut the dependency, but they are both part of, let's say, a product group, right? Well, they try to satisfy larger objectives for the organization. How do they work together to maximize something bigger, right? How do they improve together? That's another feedback loop that you need. So the introduction of that type of mechanisms is a, a, is a scaling problem in the depth dimension. Now, throw in your toolbox of choice for solutions and particular, and particular uh, 
practices to apply. So Kanban will recommend some things, but Safe will recommend some other. All right, so uh, we have to be mindful of time. Yes. Uh, so let's run very quickly through uh, uh, like the scale free assumption and the knowledge dimension. So let's turn our attention to these two tables and ask their representatives to, to share their biggest takeaways. Thank you. When, when I personally think about scale free uh, systems, I naturally get to think about small plates and uh, Fibonacci spiral. <laughs> That's what I started with at the beginning, but after our team discussion, what we came up with was um, uh, basically it, it's the, uh, the kind of things that can be applied to uh, any system, regardless of their size or their level. So um, it, could be, it could be a notion or a concept like work item type, for example. Uh, for a, an individual Kanban board, you need, a, you need a work item type. For a team Kanban board, you still need a work item type. The concept of the work item type applies to a portfolio Kanban, whatever Kanban it is. <clears throat> or it could be maybe some, some Kanban principles that can be applied to any, any Kanban system. It could be some simple structure that can be replicated uh, regarding the, the size of the system. Or, uh, we have another example of, uh, in the sense that every system should have some, some kind of goal or objective. Um, that could be one of, one of the scale free assumptions. Uh, even it could include something like a cost or benefit, the concept of cost to benefit or budget. Uh, and these are what we have come up with. All right, let's ask uh, the knowledge table to, uh, to read their takeaways. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we thought a couple of points were valid, and we have, uh, we have a couple of notes and uh, a few things we want to add. So the first um, question we want to was around advantages and disadvantages of training. We think that um, training is important and good because it establishes a standard baseline. But it is important when you are doing training to accommodate different learning styles because everybody learns differently. And because you want to go and show some ROI, measure a uh, baseline for whatever you're doing training on uh, before and after so you can prove the value. Uh, we thought uh, coaching and mentorship was uh, China? very important. Um, oh, China. Uh, from personal experience, I did a lot of training and I did apply it and I forgot it. So you don't want that. You want to have a coach and a mentor to uh, work with you to make the training uh, an automatic and subconscious habit and you won't be there to improve your learning. And uh, when you've truly mastered the material, you'll actually transcend and go beyond what you were originally taught and perhaps become uh, an expert on your own. The other point was around um, approaches in companies that have been found to be effective. Uh, community practice is something that uh, is effective. Um, and what you really want is a, a, a learning organization and, uh, and have a culture that encourages and inspires learning and it's very focused on learning and a technique that can also be very helpful is uh, the notion of experimentation. You're not, you're not changing something, you've done some training, you just do an experiment to see if um, uh, it applies in your situation without doing a change and there's no such thing as a failed experiment. Anybody else want to add right the same? All right. Well, uh, uh, thank you all uh, very much. Now, I'm Fernando and I are just going to try to be as concise as if we were to put five bits of advice on one slide. So that's just really the minimum for each of the five dimensions. I would say this. So as far as the width, think time and customer contact. So the, 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 the wider the, 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 you, you, you grow your improvement initiative, the closer you get to customers, 
the better you understand them. And also mastering the time in your process from we promise to here it is, is going to be important the closer you get to that mastery. As far as the height dimension, not everything has to be a ticket on some visual board. Maximize the fan out and the information gain between levels. Strive for fewer levels. Question levels beyond two relentlessly. On depth dimension, and the thorny issue of dependencies, some dependencies don't exist for a good reason, and you can get rid of them. Some of them exist for a very good reason, and you have to figure out what to do when two services connect. In short, whoever is accountable for one particular service or a product line or a project group, whatever is this interdependent thing is, have them mind their own service first. And then learn to talk to their peers because everyone who delivers a service is also a customer of some other service. So you kind of have to play on both sides in this network. And then... Sorry, one, just, just, just yeah. remind me of one thing I forgot to mention when we were discussing this. In addition to the commitment point, the other big question that appears here when you are dealing with that dimension is who's responsible here? Who's taking responsibility for delivering end-to-end? -end? It's a question that's not that obvious sometimes. Right. So finding that responsible or even better yet accountable person, and in some languages these two words are synonymous, and in the North American corporate English they're not. Um, okay, so when you have these uh, responsible or accountable people talking to each other and each of them gets to play a customer sometimes and a service provider in other situations. You need a system of organizational feedback loops and here we want to emphasize uh, an important principle of cadence. Uh, yes, for those of you familiar with the Kanban method, you know there's a system of cadences there. Uh, whether you use that particular solution template or something else, there is one important principle that comes out of Don Reinhardson's Principles of Product you know, Flow book, particularly princi uh, the principles of cadence, uh, and uh, he also called it by a fancy term, principle of a variability substitution. So in plain English, that means aim for regular intervals between reviews. When you review how this network of services performs, aim for regular intervals rather than even amounts of information and learning produced in those reviews. Better have a monthly review, which sometimes produces a lot of insight and sometimes very little, than waiting maybe a month or a week or a year until you have enough volume of information to process. So, so cadence, meaning regular reviews, uh, inspecting how, how your multiple services actually work together. About scale-free, uh, so we would say that, the, um, and this may be kind of an in, inconvenient uh, truth for some consultants, the businesses we already work with, they already figured out how to grow and operate the scale they're already at. It's a solved problem for us. If we have a scaling pro, they don't. We are behind them. Right, So we have to work, if something already exists in the business, uh, in their actual business of a certain scale, we basically have to incorporate that into our model as opposed to try to bend their business to our models. Right, And that's why we try to design, let's say, cards in our visual flow management systems to actually match the units of commitments that those business actually practice with their customers. And that's, that's how we get to ride some of that scale-free assumption. As far as the knowledge dimension, this one probably frustrated me the most. And uh, speaking for the particular kind of continuous improvement community that I belong to for a little over a decade, I would say, uh, our recipe for dealing with this dimension is really that. So it's just you find the gem, you keep it. And once every few years, we find something really ingenious, some, some technique that helps us bridge this dimension, and then we just re realize what we just discovered, and then we use it consciously, and we don't throw it away. And that's, that's, that's the best I have after about 13 years of trying. 
so it's re it's really a hard one. So so your uh, your solutions to this uh, will probably be be very specific to your profession, to your field of knowledge, and so on. That's the question, uh, Jim. Uh, can that be is, does this difference the diamonds as a girl in the company customers? No, it's it, it's uh, actually it's applicable to to the whole class of problems rather than to one particular customer. So it's uh, but but uh, you don't find it uh, re uh, very often. So so you find it once, and yes, it works for a whole bunch of different companies and different situations. But uh, it's going to be a few years until you find another one. <laughs> Yeah, still don't get it, but I, I'm, I'm just getting the idea that, I, that I, if you get a chance to find is something that writes enough you know, for the customer, and in your case, mm -hmm. you're a consultant, I guess you try to replicate that over to other customers because you, you realize that worked here, that potential might work so well. Uh, no, no, we're talking about something more powerful than it just works on my machine. No, clearly, because that, 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 that would be something we find every day, right? <laughs> but something much more universal. So if you really have a a, a, a real breakthrough, uh, that, that uh, something that actually works, something that's broadly applicable, some some that, that has to be a pretty deep idea and uh, and practice. Uh, that doesn't such discoveries just don't happen very often, and that that's uh, maybe what I I have to admit. Maybe it's what's in the next slide. Uh, no, the next slide we are actually going into something that uh, I wish we still had time for. I think we do. So, shall we? Okay, so folks, uh, I'm, we're, we're going to switch gears here. We're going to talk about this really important book, which is actually called Scale. Uh, the author is Jeffrey, Geoffrey West. Uh, who is uh, like uh, like kind of a uh, uh, like a really fascinating uh, personality? Uh, so he he is approximately eighty years old at this time. He made a career in the twentieth century as a theoretical physicist in the field of elementary particles, and then about thirty years ago, when he was still uh, about fifty, so pretty young age, he kind of made the switch to biology. And so he kind of moved from Los Alamos lab where he worked on his elementary particles over to Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. And something should be said about Santa Fe Institute is the word interdisciplinary is overused in the scientific community, but when they use it at Santa Fe, they mean a lot more than lip service. So, uh, when he encountered the world of biology and started bringing in all sorts of multidisciplinary people to work on all sorts of problems of scaling of living organisms, cities, social networks, companies, and whatnot, uh, he made an interesting observation. Folks, I think it's a pretty common knowledge that physics can be both theoretical and experimental. I'm, I'm not really saying anything new here, right? So for example, uh, theoretical physicists can solve all sorts of equations and predict the particle, and then there's this giant collider where they discover that particle, right? Or there could be laws of planetary motion, right, that can be observed by astronomers, but you know what? Those laws actually have a mathematical derivation. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton did that. And what's interesting is that biology doesn't seem to have that theoretical component at all, and that's what uh, Mr. West discovered. It seems to be a purely experimental and empirical science. And so he tried to introduce this theoretical rigor that, you know, let's say a physicist would enjoy, the mathematical apparatus. And those are some of the things that he found. So it turns out there is a whole science of scale, and it, the science speaks what will sound in this room like very arcane language. And of course, our goal for tonight is not to learn that language, just to recognize this science exists and potentially have some profound implications for what all we do. And so if we look at these charts, we see there's some interesting laws of scale to... Um, Let's say we're talking about animals here, about innovation, 
or crime, which are kind of the good and the bad of social networking, right? So um, West writes actually about animals first in his book, and he actually uh, devotes close to half of the book in it. So here's the scale of metabolic rate of animals, which is a fancy term for animal eats its food and then converts that into energy, which it uses for whatever it does in its life. It turns out that, and again, in this arcane language, animals scale by the law of three quarters, which you can kind of detect there is some incline of that straight line going through the chart, that if we uh, increase the size of the animal by four orders of magnitude, the amount of food it actually needs increases only by three orders of magnitude. So there's economy of scale there, right? So, uh, so, so a, a horse is so much stronger than a dog, but actually uh, the horse, like per, per pound per pound, is more efficient than, than the dog. What's astonishing about this law of three quarters, it actually has a mathematical derivation. So, and this is within the mathematical skill set of a theoretical physicist. That if you actually start with these three principles, again, that's part of arcane language, you don't need to fully understand it. You solve a whole bunch of equations and your answer is n divided by n plus 1, where n is the number of dimensions in the world inhabited by the animal. Which means in our world, that's 3. So, 3, 3 fourths. So, uh, what's interesting is the physical infrastructure of of cities scales in a very similar fashion, except that the exponent instead of 0.75 is slightly different, it's 8.5. Now, one arcane term uh, is going to be important in about five minutes, so I'm going to spend a few seconds on it. It's called terminal units. So terminal units in animals, including us, that's like capillaries in our vascular system or it could be nerve endings in our nervous system. Terminal units in, let's say, our city's transportation network, that's like a bus stop. A terminal unit in a bank, that would be a branch, right? And so on. So, net so the notion of terminal unit is an uh, important one in the network design. All right, so let's look at the cities. So what's interesting is cities scale in a similar fashion but the exponent is greater than 1. It's not 0.75 or 0.85, it's like 1.15, it's greater than 1. And what this means, and this is basically a property of social networks, rather than produce economy of scale, it produces excess returns to the same scale. So basically, if you multiply the size of a city by two or, let's say, an order of magnitude or two by a factor of 10 or 100, it doesn't produce 10 times more innovation or 100 times. It produces more than that. So there is an extra production thanks to the network effect that comes from having a larger city and a greater number of people. So 10 cities the size of, uh, let's say, Santa Fe, they do not produce, which is, has a population of about 100,000 people, do not produce as much innovation as one, million, uh, one city of 1 million inhabitants. And 10 cities of 1 million inhabitants do not produce as much innovation as one city of 10 million and so on. So, so there's excess return to scale. What's interesting that the companies, corporations, that have both the infrastructure component and the social network component, they scale just with the exponent of one. So they scale perfectly linearly. And so there is sublinear scaling, there's superlinear scaling, there's linear scaling. Sublinear scaling leads to mortality. So eventually the energy that is entering the living organism is used for growth and maintenance. Eventually it grows big enough that it's all used for maintenance and that's when the aging and death process begins. Right? So that's why all animals, including us, are mortal. The super linear scaling does not have this problem and that's why cities historically have been known to bounce back even if they were completely destroyed by wars and natural disasters. Right? Because the social network that existed in that place once in history, tends to bounce back and, and rebuild itself. 
And the company is scaling linearly, which means they don't actually grow relative to the size of the society and market that they operate in. They basically face a certain uh, kind of um, uh, process of natural death uh, with like half decay of every 10 years or something like that. So, folks, important thing between the important difference between linear and sublinear, what's, what's in these networks, why they scale so differently. The, it, with the sublinear scaling, you get the biggest flow through the aorta, right? So the, 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 the sublinear scaling of animals, uh, of, of their like metabolic network, you get the biggest flow through the aorta, a little bit less through the, uh, as the aorta breaks down into several arteries and arteries break down into smaller arteries, the slowest flow rate is through the capillaries. The same thing with the city infrastructure. There's no coincidence, it's like no coincidence that the biggest roads are also called arteries. And so, so this is Union Station here, so I won't dwell too much on that example. So, uh, and what's interesting, this is also the traditional industrial org design, right? So your company's annual budget is the aorta, then it breaks down into various business units, various departments, departments of the sub-departments, so on. Eventually the terminal unit is what? There's a particular position with the job description and the salary range, and we need to put a person there and perform a function, right? That's the terminal unit in the, in the network that is a traditional uh, org design. And what happens in the social networks, the greatest flow is actually not at the aorta, it's, in the, it's near the terminal units. Think about your own social networks. If you're gonna post something on Facebook and LinkedIn, who's going to respond to that? Your closest five friends, maybe your closest 15, maybe your closest 50 if you're very popular. Uh, who is going to like, who is going to comment? Who are you going to talk most on your phone um, by all your means of communication? It's your first couple of degrees of separation. That's where most of the action is. And this begs the beautiful question, shouldn't we build our 21st century and our future awesome companies as a social network? Okay, well, as soon as you say this and you want this to sound more than just a completely impractical platitude, you have to answer the question, what are the terminal units then? How do they connect? Right? Like natural question, if you were to build the electrical uh, network, right? You need to know something about wires and outlets and uh, that sort of stuff, right? So you want to build the social network, what are you building it with? And so, I want to kind of give props, Fernando and I are giving these props to two particular approaches. So Jeff Anderson, our friend who talks at these sort of meetups quite often, uh, written a book recently organizing toward agility. So clearly, um, like if you read his book, if you listen to Jeff, where's a lot of action? People, teams, and how, uh, like pairing, mobbing, um, one person helping another team, several interconnected teams helping each other, lots of action at those levels. So teams and individuals, smart people, as terminal units in Jeff's uh, agile social network. Uh, for Fernando and I, and we take a somewhat different approach, our terminal unit is a service, which could be really any, anything, could be any field of expertise, be it are you good at databases? Are you good at UX? Uh, do you know all sorts of arcane privacy regulations? Um, what is that something like that you're deep, where you have deep knowledge? You can wrap it up in the service. Who are your customers? Who come to your desk? Who send you all those incessant emails asking for your advice? Who are your customers? How are you serving them? How much of that stuff do they want? How do you deliver it to them? And at any level uh, of scale, uh, you can uh, ask a question, what's the service here? Who is the customer? What is being delivered? In what quantity subject to what uh, quality criteria? In what time? 
and who is responsible or accountable for that, right? And that's the building unit for your uh, for your social network. So you basically canonize and improve your own service. Others in your organization will do the same, and then you start talking to each other and figuring out how, uh, and basically debugging the network and letting it balance itself via organizational feedback loops. So the whole business is a network of interdependent services. So reasonable people can argue which approach is better. I would say probably either is better than, and by this time I have probably impressed you that the topic of scale needs some elevation of language. We used to talk about it. And clearly, just give me a bigger number, or my number is bigger than yours. That's basically not going to cut it. That's too naive. Uh, naive approaches to scale, such as you know, creating overhead that scales as you know n squared. You bump into pretty hard physical constraints very quickly. So all sorts of naive approaches of teams of teams. Um, uh, time boxes extending from two weeks to three months. Um, that's not going to cut it. We need a more intelligent way of thinking and talking about the issues of scale. And um, the last 20 or so minutes was my attempt to, to stimulate that sort of conversation. And now I think we are mostly done and any remaining questions and answers will fall. And of course, the after Thank part. Thank you so much, Fernando. And please give them a round of applause. You are looking short on time. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>